This is the nature of things. We have been living with squirrels in Canada and the northern U.S. since the end of the last ice age 12,000 years ago. And for most of that time, we looked at squirrels as nothing more than nourishment. How odd that in the last 100 years, we have gone from eating the squirrels to now feeding the squirrels. Since we've taken them off the menu, the population of eastern gray squirrels has exploded. This adaptable species comes in a variety of colors, gray, brown, black, and even white. We see squirrels everywhere, but their erratic, squirrely behavior can make them a difficult animal to really appreciate or admire. Could there possibly be more to them than meets the eye? There are those of us who see squirrels as endlessly entertaining animals that are worthy of our attention and even our handouts. But there's also a strong contingent that regards squirrels as nothing more than tree rats. One thing is for sure, most of us know precious little about our acrobatic fellow urbanites. Next to us, squirrels are the most commonly observed mammals in North America. They're everywhere. They seem to particularly like our urban environment. And because they keep similar hours to us, we see them almost every day. We live parallel lives of indifference. That is, unless you're trying to feed the birds or simply maintain a garden. They're just vandals. They're garden vandals as they just come in and they want to have a bit of fun and destroy some stuff just senselessly. Our interaction with squirrels can quickly descend into a warlike mentality, an ongoing struggle to keep them out of our space. I've tried loads of things to try to get these buggers to stop doing it. Like blood meal is something that you can scatter down, but when the, when the garden gets watered, that gets washed away so they'll come back. So psychologically, the worst thing for me, I suppose, is to have to admit that I, I pierced behind that tree there to lay my scat down to try and um, discourage them. It doesn't seem to have done anything for squirrels, but raccoons don't come around so much. And as the insults grow and the frustrations mount, we start to see squirrels as a true pest with no redeeming qualities. I have fantasized about air rifles and uh, explosives, you know, just small ones, as a means to uh, stop these little squirrels. Squirrels can drive us crazy, but how much do we really know about them? Well, I'm fairly ignorant of, of what they're doing. I don't know where they live around here. They're just vermin. Everybody around here hates them. Joel Brown, a professor at the University of Illinois in Chicago, believes it all starts with looking at our neighborhoods differently, by seeing them as they really are, one big urban wildlife park. Unintentionally, we ecologists often create a bias where people perceive natural areas as having better wildlife and that somehow the wildlife in our backyards is tainted by us. But in fact, the wildlife in our backyard is just as natural as what you'll find in a national park, a natural area. We design our backyards for us, but inadvertently, we're also creating a squirrel ecosystem, if not a theme park. We construct a habitat of buildings, of lawns, of parks. We create a habitat that has hazards and opportunities. And it is this habitat to which the squirrel responds. It is to this habitat that the squirrels then actually form a niche. They form a lifestyle around us. Professor Brown has devised a simple yet ingenious experiment to see this world as a squirrel might. 
These sea trays allow us to actually get into the mind of the squirrel. As the squirrel forages through these sea trays, what it leaves behind across its landscape becomes a projection of its mind. So we use these sea trays then as a way to actually see what the squirrel is thinking about. The experiment is centered around this grid of evenly spaced food trays that the squirrels will choose between over the next 24 hours. I'm setting up a food tray by pouring in a measured amount of sunflower seeds and then mix these sunflower seeds into the sand. The idea is that the first sunflower seeds are easy to get. And then as the squirrel depletes the tray, it becomes harder and harder. And eventually the squirrel then reaches a point at which it gives up and then leaves. Then to finish off the food tray, we have the squirrel's equivalent of a $5 bill. By placing this peanut on top of the tray, we have an added inducement for our squirrel to come and visit this tray today. With Professor Brown gone, the squirrels quickly move in and start to forage across the grid of food trays in the front and backyard. Where they feel safe, they'll spend more time digging through the sand, looking for every last seed. But where they sense risk, they grab and run. The more seeds left behind, the greater their perceived sense of danger for that part of the yard. <laughs> Professor Brown leaves the suburban land of squirrels behind and heads downtown to meet museum curator Steve Sullivan on a recruiting drive. You're going to see some of the really surprising results. That Together, they hope to convince this audience to become citizen scientists and join them on Project so Squirrel. The objective of Project Squirrel is to mobilize citizens to contribute to an ongoing squirrel census. There's only 14 questions, and it asks you things like, what is your zip code, and how many squirrels did you see? Project Squirrel has already generated some fascinating insights into how we live with squirrels. Thanks to the citizens who have participated in Project Squirrel, we've been able to document the changes in the squirrel population right here in this neighborhood of Oak Park. We've seen in the last 15 years how it's changed from entirely fox squirrels to now entirely gray squirrels. Chicago is home to two species of squirrels, fox and gray. The main difference is the orange-tinged fur on the fox squirrel. And like rival gangs, these two species tend to divide up the city between them. So what caused the graying of this neighborhood? Well, it's actually things like leash laws, which were enacted about, oh, 10, 15 years ago. Furthermore, pet ownership patterns have changed. People are more likely to keep their cats indoors. People have smaller dogs. They're more inclined to keep those dogs indoors. All of that creates the kind of safe circumstances that allows gray squirrels to outcompete fox squirrels. In the end, the gray squirrels of this neighborhood are a reflection of the people of this neighborhood. But of course, not every Chicago neighborhood has followed the same trend. Here in the Austin neighborhoods, we are just a very short distance from Oak Park. We might expect the same thing to be going on here in Austin. In fact, what we discover here in Austin, this is a neighborhood that is dominated by fox squirrels. First, that seems a little bit puzzling, and indeed, we were puzzled. But on closer inspection, you find a neighborhood in which people's patterns of pet ownership is a bit different than Oak Park, only slightly. But people here in the Austin neighborhoods, because of their circumstances, are somewhat more likely to use dogs as guard dogs in their backyard rather than <laughs> keeping them indoors. And fox squirrels, unlike the greys, aren't intimidated by aggressive guard dogs. They're a little bit larger than gray squirrels. That allows them to throw their weight around a little bit more in the face of predation. And they have a temperament in which they focus on their predators. They're less skittish, 
They're even known to approach their predators and taunt their predators. This allows fox squirrels then to be more successful than gray squirrels in an environment where you have more natural predators. So in a sense then, the fox and the gray squirrels provide a living indicator of ourselves and the way we manage ourselves in our neighborhoods. Joel returns to his backyard experiment to collect what the squirrels have left behind. It's been a really great day. We put out the food trays this morning. The squirrels have been feeding in them all day long. And now we come in the afternoon and we collect the dregs. We sieved out of the food trays what the squirrels were not willing to harvest or feed on. It is these seeds that they left behind that we will take back to the lab. We will weigh them. And in this way, the squirrels will tell us what they thought of this yard. Most mornings, Professor Brown has his morning coffee, marks some papers, and spends some quality time with the family pet, Squirrel. Hey, Brown, you? Ordinarily, I would not recommend that anybody keep a squirrel in the house. They're wild animals. Um, in a sense, they really don't make the best pets in the entire world. You've really got to love squirrels to keep one as a pet. But Rowdy is a special case. Rowdy represents then essentially a failure of rehabilitation. So ideally, we would have liked him to have rehabbed and been out in the wild. But now, six years later, Rowdy is still here. Uh, you couldn't release Rowdy. Rowdy likes people, will run up to people. Um, and of course, that can be quite terrifying. Uh, he can on occasion bite, which can be rather painful and is sort of socially unacceptable. Rowdy, just like squirrels in the wild, is a people watcher. The squirrels in the city will actually get to know us quite well. In fact, remarkably well, probably better than we get to know them. Uh, they will learn when we get up in the morning. They will learn when we leave. They will learn which people feed them. They will learn which people chase them. And all of that makes perfect sense because we are a critical part of their ecology. What they don't do is they have no sense as to why we do what we do. They simply know what we do and why it's important to them. And that's true of Rowdy. <laughs> he has no idea why I do what I do. <laughs> this is what Rowdy has missed out on. Squirrels can transform our parks and backyards into one big open air circus. They carry on like clowns perform the death-defying high wire act, and then climb to great heights into the treetops to leap with total abandon from branch to branch, and all without a safety net. But this is their natural element, and their bodies have evolved over millennia to facilitate life in the trees. When we see a squirrel running up the side of a tree, it's not. This squirrel is leaping, letting go with all four paws, and then on landing, sinking its razor-sharp claws into the trunk. This squirrel is in a full gallop up this tree, but it's their hind feet that allow squirrels to really defy gravity. As they move down a tree, their back paws rotate 180 degrees. Their toes are now pointing backwards, giving them greater leverage and holding them fast to the tree trunk as they descend head first. Squirrels are incredibly agile, but how smart are they? Do they really remember where they hide their acorns? Sharing the city with us provides squirrels with easy food. This supplementary food has allowed city squirrel populations to explode to levels 10 times greater than what we see in nature. But as the leaves and temperatures start to drop, 
city squirrels get off the junk food and get back to a more traditional diet. Nuts, such as acorns. Because squirrels don't hibernate, they need to store hundreds, if not thousands, of acorns in separate caches dug into the ground, a layaway plan for the upcoming winter. Meet a true squirrel whisperer. Professor Mike Steele from Wilkes University in Pennsylvania has been studying squirrel foraging and caching behavior for over 30 years, and he sees the method in their apparent madness. Virtually every movement, every behavioral act is a careful uh, decision process that's uh, absolutely critical for uh, survival that's been honed over uh, thousands of years of evolution. For example, consider a squirrel's behavior when it comes across an acorn. When they encounter an acorn, they engage in what we call uh, rolling behavior, uh, usually for about 20 seconds, maybe a little longer. And they uh, often lick the seed, roll it around. Um, we're, we're pretty clear that they are assessing the, the quality of the seed with respect to whether it should be cached or eaten. Dr. Steele is hoping to answer the universal question, do squirrels actually remember where they bury their nuts? This is squirrel detective work. To understand what happens to buried acorns, you need to be able to track them. Andrew, a student of Dr. Steele's, is preparing some special acorns. These tiny pit tags give off a signal that allows the researchers to follow the fate of each acorn after it's been buried. And the squirrel will never know. It's December, and the professor's students have come to this city park early with their traps and radio-tagged acorns to study the mysterious world of squirrel nut caching. The experiment begins as Andrew and his brother Chris try to get a squirrel to cache several of those doctored acorns. Here, watch that squirrel. Watch where he goes. He took our acorn, he didn't cache it. Um, so now we have to find another squirrel and we'll try it again. Getting a single squirrel to bury several acorns embedded with pit tags is the most important and least controllable part of this entire experiment. <laughs> Up the tree again. Uh, he's just sitting there eating it. With the acorn devoured and the pit tag spat out, the students must now try again. There, he's actually cashing that one. He's cashing this one. Yeah, he pushed it down in. Cash. He's covering it up. Okay. Flag it. Yeah, I got it. Chris temporarily marks the first cash site. He'll record the GPS coordinates later. They'll need several more cache sites created by the same squirrel. However, their job is complicated by the fact that squirrels will often try to fake the location of their cache. So if a squirrel is nearby and uh, an animal um, uh, perceives the risk of having the seeds stolen, they will often engage in what we call behavioral deception, where they um, put the acorn in the mouth, um, excavate a cache site, uh, put the head down in as if they're planting the seed in the uh, deep into the cache site, and then they go back and forth with the hands, um, cover, uh, attempting to cover over the cache site. And the animal nearby will come and look for the cache, and the um, uh, the animal with the seed has now moved off and is caching the seed in another location. Behavioral deception is relatively rare in the animal kingdom, and, and in particular, tactical deception, uh, which is thought to be primarily the realm of, of primates. So it raises some interesting questions about the 
cognitive ability of these animals, although there's much more work to be done on that. But first, there's more work to be done here in the park. The squirrel that cached all those tagged acorns must now be trapped. Do you see that squirrel? Do you think it's the one we're looking for? Yeah, I think so. Oh, yeah, there's his mark right there. Perfect. Let's chop that. Perfect. Do you still see him? Yeah. They need to catch the squirrel so they can remove it from the park. In its absence, they will monitor the buried acorns to see if they're discovered by other squirrels. Or do they stay in the ground, suggesting a buried acorn is the domain of a single squirrel? Oh, yeah, got we it. got him. Hopefully it's the one we need. Is yep, it him? Perfect. All right, you're going to Dr. Steve's right. house. Let's bring him back. Okay, here you go, little fella. Home for the next short time. This will be the home for the target squirrel for the next two weeks. While the squirrel settles into his new digs, Rachel conducts the first survey of the tagged acorns. Her GPS directs her to each cache site, where the pit tag reader indicates if the acorn is still there. So far, it seems that none of the acorns has been disturbed by the other park squirrels. I think people can be really surprised how much squirrels can remember because we don't usually associate small brains with the ability to remember things like where I put a bunch of acorns. And even though humans have large brains, I frequently forget where I put my car keys <laughs> at night. Rain or shine, night and day, the students return every 12 hours to check on the tagged acorns. And after two weeks, they're all still in place. But what happens next when the target squirrel is released? Will it remember its cache sites and return to them? And now we have him here packed in leaves to keep him a little calm. And we're going to release him, and then we'll be tracking the acorns over the next few weeks to see if he does, in fact, move them. They released him uh, 36 hours ago. Dr. Steele and Andrew perform their rounds, checking on the tagged acorns now that the target squirrel has been released. Let's, let's check out wider, um, uh, in a wider area to make sure, just to verify that you don't have it. Yeah, it's... Not getting a signal? It's gone. Ah, that's great. It moved. Ah, man, this animal's been busy. I've got one more? Yep. OK. It's amazing that we've seen a couple of seeds disappear already since the animal was released. That's amazing. Strongly suggest that, the, that they're uh, remembering their caches. So Dr. Steele now has his answer. Squirrels do remember where they bury their nuts. But how? We know that they can um, locate an individual cache by virtually triangulating on it from uh, stationary objects in a mental way. That's right, triangulating. The squirrel chooses a cache site using the distance to and the angle of fixed objects like trees and rocks. These landmarks will later guide it back to the exact location of the acorn. When you consider that each squirrel remembers the location of hundreds and hundreds of buried acorns, it's hard not to be impressed. If we consider the fact that they can remember where caches are, they can uh, locate specific caches, at least on the short term, through triangulation, and the ability to perform deceptive caching, it raises some very interesting questions about the uh, ability of the animals to solve some very complicated problems. Uh, what's the appetite to think that there's far more going on than just caching the seed and then forgetting about it until sometime later when you need the food? It's quite impressive. 
smart and adaptable become a lethal combination when gray squirrels move into new territory. This is Northumberland, the north of England. It's changed little since the conquering Romans arrived in the second century and built Hadrian's Wall to mark their northern boundary. Well, today, there's a new invader on the horizon. Our own gray squirrel has arrived. In the late 19th century, Victorians visiting our North American cities were taken by these bold and playful little creatures. They brought them back home to England, released them into their parks and gardens, and forgot about them. The ever adaptable gray squirrel has thrived here ever since. But their success has come at a dear cost. While the invasive grays have constantly expanded their territory, the native red squirrel's domain has shrunk further and further. At their peak, there were several million red squirrels in England. Today, the population hovers around 25,000. Dr. Lisa Signorelli is a biologist at the London Zoological Society. But instead of studying the zoo's more exotic and popular residents, she settled on squirrels, dead squirrels. She wants to understand why gray squirrels are so invasive and ultimately successful in expanding into new territory. Gray squirrels are great as invaders. They can form the population starting from just two or three individuals. They're fantastic from this point of view. Dr. Signorelli has been collecting DNA samples from gray squirrels across Britain. The easiest way is to take some from the tip of the ear. It just contains a little bit of flesh, that is all I need. The DNA tells a story of where the squirrel come from, and we can actually track the movement of that population across space and across time. It's a bit like uh, squirrel uh, CSI. That is a bit like investigating in uh, the private life of squirrels. And this detective work is of vital importance because of what could happen when two genetically distinct populations that were introduced here at different times meet up. When two different populations mix, uh, they bring different kinds of genes and the genetic diversity increases. If the genetic diversity increases, those squirrels will be more able to cope with a new, different environment. And that means that they will become more invasive and they will spread faster and possibly uh, doing more damage. And back in Northumberland, that's just what Nick Mason is trying to avoid. His organization is committed to saving the endangered reds by keeping the greys at bay. Sat on Hadrian's Wall here, it's been here for 2,000 years, and it's a good metaphor for the project work we're doing. We are sat at the edge of a battle line. Um, the River Tyne, just to the south of us here, is a real dividing line between red and grey squirrels. Um, we're sat in a place with red squirrels in this landscape. We go 10 miles to the south of here and it's solely gray squirrels. If there is one stronghold left for the red squirrels, it's here in Kielder Forest. One third of England's remaining red squirrels live here. It's tea time at the castle. But don't think for a moment this lineup is for the scones. It's the red squirrels they've come to see. on a live video feed from deep inside the forest. I think many of the communities do look at something like the red squirrel as a heritage feature that they want to see retained, something that links clearly to um, several centuries of cultural identity. They don't want to see yet another thing changing around them. Biologist Dr. Peter Lertz has studied the steady decline of the red squirrel population for the last 20 years. 
we know why red squirrels are declining. They basically get hit twice. There's competition with grey squirrels for resources and the grey squirrels carry a, a deadly virus that kills the red squirrels within two weeks. The grey squirrels carry the squirrel pox but are themselves unaffected by the disease. It particularly goes for the, the digital skin, so the, the fingers, but also the eyelids, so they, they have crusted eyes, they, they can hardly see, they, they can't feed themselves properly. And back in Northumberland, Emma Wright is working to save red squirrels from such a gruesome fate as she makes her way up a strategic river valley, setting up squirrel reconnaissance equipment at key points along the way. Hopefully the squirrels, whether they're red or grey, will be attracted to that feeder box. Uh, and then anything that goes in front of this camera uh, will trigger the camera to take an image, whether it's red squirrels or, or grey squirrels. And lately, these remote cameras have captured several photographs of the advancing grey squirrels. With their pictures in hand, Emma and Nick go to meet the local landowners to try to enlist their support in turning back the greys. And where else to do that but at the local pub? One particular square that really concerned us was, you'll see Slaley Forest, um, which we always talk about as a real safe sort of stronghold for red squirrels up here. Um, so to find a grey in there is really concerning. It doesn't mean that the reds are doomed here, it just means that we really need to focus on what we're doing. If the greys are penetrating that deep, um, we need to be acting. And these landowners have noticed the advancing grey squirrels as well. Two and a half years ago, we didn't have a sighting. Well, recently, I've had three sightings on my patch, where we haven't had one. And that's before. just been in the last fortnight, you said. That's in the last yeah. two weeks. So what we've said. With most of the room on side, Nick pleads the for their support. Weeks. Please, please get involved with that process, because this is just a start point. That's all this is. The next morning, a lone ranger, employed by Red Squirrel Northern England, is dispatched to where the greys have recently been spotted. Once we've actually caught a squirrel, we use a method called cranial dispatch to, to kill it. Um, this involves a, a short, sharp blow to the back of the head, the cranium. Um, it's a very humane method. It doesn't cause any additional suffering to the, to the squirrel itself. Uh, which is the point of, of working with wild animals when you have to kill them, is to minimize the suffering. This is the controversial part of the program, the gray squirrel cull. And although it's supported by Prince Charles himself, trapping a steady migration of constantly adapting squirrels across a vast landscape is a tall order. Perhaps science has a better solution. Dr. Colin McInnes at the Morden Institute outside Edinburgh is working around the clock on a squirrel pox vaccine that could protect red squirrels against the disease. One of the things that we're trying to do is produce a vaccine uh, and we produce that from the, the virus itself so we have to grow the virus uh, in cells, in culture. So these are the, the cells that uh, the virus is growing in. While McInnes is confident that the vaccine will work, there is still the challenge of actually inoculating all those red squirrels. Hopefully we can deliver uh, to the red squirrels through some sort of oral route, potentially having feeding stations where the uh, red squirrels would be able to go along and eat the, the baited food and uh, be vaccinated that way. But it probably will not be the silver bullet. I think it will be uh, just one of a number of measures that we'll have to take uh, to help protect the, the reds and stop them from becoming extinct. Unlike North America, squirrels here in England are a serious and divisive issue. But is it really worth all the blood, sweat and tears? I think m most of the people that visit this landscape, visit Hadrian's Wall and Keel the Forest, they may, may never notice a difference if we are successful in our efforts. You know, we don't want to encourage people to hate grey squirrels, but it's important that they understand why we're doing what we're trying to do, why we're out here trapping, killing, removing grey squirrels from this landscape. It's the only way to provide a future for red squirrels. 
how do these lethal tourists navigate through the dangerous landscapes of our backyards? A squirrel's most prominent feature has to be its bushy tail. which is as long as their body. A squirrel's tail is essential to their comfort. They use it as an umbrella in the rain, and they wrap themselves with it to stay warm in the winter. But it also keeps them cool in the summer. They push extra blood into the tail in order to give off excess heat. The tail is also used as a crucial counterbalance as they course through the branches high up in the trees. But there is another use for their tail. Dr. Sarah Parton from Hampshire College studies how squirrels communicate, specifically how they use their tail to get their message across. The tail flick is a, uh, a small signal where the tail stays relatively parallel to the body, and the tail flag comes all the way up over its body and sometimes whirls around. Okay. With the help of her students, Dr. Parton has built these robots that mimic how squirrels communicate in the wild. What we've done is we've built this squirrel robot, and it does two things. It tail flags, and it emits barking vocalizations, and we have that program to our computer. After months of toiling over their fur and circuitry, it's time for Motley's first big day on campus. Motley must remain undercover until the trial begins to avoid tipping off the campus squirrels of his arrival. Make sure the angle's good. As the trial begins, Dr. Parton and her students observe and record the reaction of nearby squirrels to determine if they're responding to Motley's attempts to communicate. From her earlier field work, Sarah Parton believes that the squirrels are reacting to the robot's tail flicks and vocalizations. So far, it looks like their responses to the robotic squirrel are realistic, so they're giving biologically appropriate responses to the robotic squirrel. But Dr. Parton wants to take this experiment a step further, to see if the campus squirrels will respond to Motley when there is no Motley. We are wondering now if we isolate the tail flagging separate from the rest of the, of the body, would the tail flagging alone be um, carry that message of alarm? It's called sign stimulus, and it happens in nature when animals fix on one simple environmental cue and ignore everything else. Well, our, our first thought was that we need the whole body in order to uh, convince the squirrels that this is a real squirrel. Uh, but in a, with a lot of animals, you, there's a situation where an animal can communicate, and it turns out that it's just the bright red throat color of the bird, for example, or the bright red on the fish's body that carries the message. So we're wondering if we isolate just the tail, which seems to carry the visual information of the message, would that be enough to uh, transmit the message of alarm, even without the whole realism of the body? Foraging. This is an early trial. But Dr. Parton believes when it comes to squirrels and communication, all they really care about is the tail. This experiment with the tail only is, is being run right now by my students in the field, so we don't have results yet. But if I had to guess, I would guess that, that they would respond to that alone. Not to denigrate the models that we've made, but uh, you know, this is, uh, it, it may not be very, all that important to them, and that flagging tail might be really the thing that catches their eye. Dr. Parton will be running more trials throughout the year before collating all her results. Meanwhile, back in Chicago, Professor Brown now has his results that reveal how squirrels see this yard. Joel has analyzed the seeds left behind by the squirrels. Where they felt safe, they ate most of the seeds. And where they sensed danger, they took just a few. So the squirrel foraging from the food trays has now allowed us to create a landscape of fear. 
We can think of it as a topographic map in which the various elevations represent how frightened the squirrels are. So to help us think about that fear, imagine the most terrified areas of this yard to the squirrel. We can think of it as about 12 feet of fear. So imagine a landscape and elevation of about 12 feet of fear. There's a valley of safety. With the help of this taxidermied squirrel, Joel starts to see the yard in a whole new way. The squirrels, through their feeding behavior, have now projected their mind into a landscape of fear. So we've had a chance then to see what squirrels think of this backyard. What the squirrels told us is this beautiful part of the yard is a region of absolute terror. This is indeed a blind alley for the squirrels. The pond, the shrubbery provide them no escape opportunities. These squirrels have about 12 feet of fear. But as this squirrel moves towards the tree over here, unsurprisingly, it begins to feel safer. We move down in fear, and as we get over towards this tree, the squirrel is actually feeling really quite safe. In fact, we can think of the fear level as being just about three feet. As we move towards this tree from this tree, there is, in fact, a valley of safety through which the squirrels can move. And as they move from that tree to this tree, they have a valley of safety that's at about three feet over towards this tree. In fact, there's like a bowl. There's kind of a depression then of safety. But as they move away from this depression of safety, very quickly we move up to a very high plateau of fear. Because as this squirrel moves through this plateau towards this yard, suddenly we have a cliff of terror rising up at this point. And as the squirrels reach this fence, we understand why. <laughs> a large, active, curious, and to a squirrel, ferocious dog. And as we move through the side yard, past the bird feeders, the shrubberies, the relative safety, we move through an area of about three feet of fear into the front yard. We didn't expect it, but here in the front yard is where the squirrels feel safest. There's a fairly uniform level of one foot of fear here in the front yard. Usually the front yard is scarier than the backyard. Here in the front yard is where the squirrels are most comfortable. But even more than that, over by this tree in front of the porch, this is where the level of fear drops from one foot to actually zero. This is the spot where the squirrels are happiest. This is the spot where the squirrel wants to be. As Professor Brown has shown, we share the city with squirrels. We just don't see it the same way. But if we start to see squirrels as resourceful, graceful, and even intelligent in ways we're just beginning to understand, perhaps a new respect can start to grow. James, the gardener who once fantasized about using small explosives to stop the troublesome squirrels, has been watching them himself. And he's come to a new realization about the critters he once characterized as garden vandals. The war is over. Coexistence is the name of the game. So I have to loosen up a bit. They're not going to change. They're squirrels. They do their squirrel thing. It's me that has to change. I've got my connection with plants pretty much down. You know, I see them and I appreciate them. And up until now, um, I haven't really made a connection with animals so much. And it's the squirrels that are giving me this opportunity to get more interested and get a, a better appreciation that it's an environment for human beings, for plants and for animals. It's for all of us. <laughs>